Well, I'm Dr. Frank Parker. I work in the hospital as a hospitalist half my time and half my time in the AIM clinic where we tend to have a problem with opioids. Uh, the, our patients have a, a peculiar and uh, complicated relationship with their opioid medications, and this cartoon kind of, uh, kind of shows that. Uh, but what we're going to do today is we're going to have a 14-question controlled substance guideline quiz. So everyone needs to have an eye clicker. You need to turn it on at the bottom and then press AA, and that, that'll get you uh, synced up to the, to the machine up here. We're going to have a little mini lecture on uh, how to uh, discuss opioids with your patients. And then we're going to do role playing and how to participate in opioid cessation. So the first question is, how confident do you feel uh, when prescribing controlled substances? Very competent, fairly competent, not very competent, or incompetent? So let me turn this on, and people can vote. Let's see how our group feels. So most pe people feel fairly confident, so that's good that we're uh, teaching you something here. Okay. So question number two. What percentage of American adults over 12 years old are using prescription pain relievers? Is it as low as 4%, 14%, 24 or 34%? So let me get it going again. There we go. Pretty evenly divided uh, between 14, 24, and 34. Actually, it turns out that it's higher than you think. Um, when you look at that first big pie chart, it says that 44.5% of Americans older than 12, you know, 119 million people in the United States are using psychotherapeutic drugs. And then it's broken down over here to 36.4% are using pain relievers. Fully a third of Americans over 12 years old are using prescription pain relievers. Question three, where do misused prescription pain relievers come from? And misused are those people that are uh, using them recreationally or not as prescribed. They come from a drug dealer, from a friend or relative. Are they stolen? Or are they prescribed by one doctor? It looks like we believe that most of them are prescribed by one doctor. And some people think that it's obtained from a friend or relative. And the actuality is that 53% are given, bought from, or taken from a friend or relative. And so it's prescriptions that we've written out there uh, for ostensibly good reasons uh, are being misused. And 34%, that is the, the second one, is pres prescription from one doctor. Question four. In Kentucky, which drug prompts the most hospitalizations for substance abuse treatment? Is it prescription opiates? Is it alcohol, is it marijuana, cocaine, or heroin? So it looks like our group, a near tie between prescription opiates and heroin. And what we see here is that uh, in 2005, it was alcohol. 42% of our inpatient admissions were for alcohol dependence. Now, in 2015, it's a different story. Uh, heroin has increased from 2% up to 26%. Uh, other opiates, and that's our prescription opiates, have increased from 10 to 20%. Alcohol still takes uh, 23%. Yeah, I think we can okay. So, question number five. In Kentucky, which of the following causes the most fatalities? Motor vehicle deaths, drug-induced deaths, gunshot deaths, or homicides? Is that across all the Yes, it's Kentucky statistics. And so our group here thinks uh, that motor vehicle accidents are number one and uh, drug-induced deaths are number two. Turns out that drug-induced deaths uh, since 2013 have been higher than uh, the motor vehicle deaths, gunshot deaths, and homicides. We had over 1,200 drug-induced drug deaths in Kentucky. Uh, in this, uh, in the year 2015. So, obviously, there's lots of problems with opiates. Uh, 
in the AIM clinic, we have the AIM controlled substance guidelines. These can be found on the Google Drive, or if you're in clinic with me, I've got it on a, a jump drive that I keep on me, then I can put it on your desktop. If you put the AIM, control, AIM chronic controlled substance guidelines on your desktop, they'll stay there because that's, that's your desktop uh, when you're signed on into AIM. Uh, and our goals for these guidelines were, were fourfold. One, we wanted to provide relief, appropriate relief, for non-cancer pain, anxiety, and, and insomnia. We wanted to limit the inappropriate prescription of controlled substances. We wanted to curtail diversion of controlled substances out there, uh, as we see uh, the people were misusing opiates, and to, to diminish the enablement of chemical dependency, because uh, many of our folks are clearly addicted. So question six, which of the following are not candidates for controlled substance management? These people we should not be treating with controlled substance management. First are patients who have active carcinomas, uh, in-stage COPD or in-stage heart failure. B, patients at their first AIM visit. C, patients who are actively using illicit drugs or abusing prescription medications. D, patients with significant psychiatric illness, interfering with their activities of daily living. Or E, all of the above. So which of these uh, should not be candidates for controlled substances? So we've got some people to weigh in still. And so our group thinks uh, that, C, the people who are actively using illicit drugs shouldn't, uh, and E, all of the above, is tied. And that's actually the case, all of the above, people who are candidates for our controlled, our chronic controlled substance management or, or people who have been fully evaluated for their pain um, and are refractory to the conservative, the non steroidals, the Tylenols, and the adjuncts, those people then might be able to move on to opiates if they're appropriate. Uh, and we're going to say we're going to apply these guidelines as a universal precaution uh, for all people that are requiring controlled substances for non-cancer pain lasting longer than three months. And the three months is what, how we diagnose chronic pain. If you've had a pain longer than three months, you're probably not going to uh, ever be rid of it. Uh, now, people that have active carcinomas will go back in stage. These people we're not putting in our controlled substance guidelines. We're not making them do urine drug screens. We're not making them fill out a contract. This is, a, this is palliative care. It's not management of non-cancer or uh, yeah, non-cancer uh, pain. Uh, at your first AIM visit, you know, you cannot prescribe opiates. Uh, the, uh, pa there are patients out there in the world who are doctor shopping and they will go from office to office and get, you know, five or ten even of their oxycodones and then move on to the next office. And so you can't be prescribed opiates in your first AIM office visit. Um, obviously, patients actively using illicit drugs um, should not be prescribed prescription opiates. Uh, and the people with significant psychiatric illness, if they can't manage their psychiatric illness, certainly the opiates aren't going to make them better. So question number seven. What should be discussed prior to prescribing chronic controlled substances? The distribution and half-life of the substances, the expected effects and side effects of controlled substances, uh, the advertisements for tranquilizers, or all of the above. And this is an important part of prescribing opiates. And so most people said B, that got, that got 50 percent, the, ex, the expected effects and side effects, and that, of course, is correct. Um, so when you have the opiates, there's things you expect to happen, and one of the things we want to do is, is reset their expectations and tell them we're talking about a two to three point diminution of their pain. That uh, one of the problems with some of our addicts is they've had their pain completely relieved. They've taken enough of, enough of oxys or enough of heroin in order to completely relieve their pain. And that's not the point when we're prescribing for pain medications. Um, they can expect to have physical dependence and tolerance as well. Things that, that might happen is the itching, the vomiting, uh, dizziness, or slowing of breathing rate and slowing of the reflexes or reaction time. One of the things that should be discussed with males when they're going on to, to take chronic opiates is the hypogonadism. There's many, 
males who are taking uh, opiates who also require testosterone uh, for their hypogonadism associated with the opiate use. And then infant addiction. If you're uh, taking opiates, your child will be addicted when they are born. They'll be tolerant and go through withdrawal. Benzodiazepines, the same thing. We're looking at two to three point improvement in their anxiety or or spasm, and uh, they're going to have physical dependence and tolerance. Uh, they can have the slowing of breathing, the reflexes. Uh, you know, the, the infant addiction, of course, is the problem here. And there's withdrawal seizures if you take off your benzodiazepine too quickly. So those are some of the things that should be discussed. Question number eight: Which patients should discontinue chronic controlled substances? Uh, those who are not having an increase in function from controlled substances those who are requiring high doses of opiates with no escalation of their opioid requirements and good function, those who are receiving benefit from controlled substances from many different providers, or D, all of the above. So this kind of gets at uh, which patients should be terminated from the chronic controlled substance use. And so most people choose all of the above. Uh, and it's a little more complicated than that. Because okay. the ones that you want to terminate from the chronic control substances are patients who are not receiving benefit from the control substances. If you ha don't have an increase in function or your pain is always 10 over 10, then that's a patient that probably should not be taking opiates. Uh, patients requiring high doses of opiates and have allodynia, in other words, Allodynia is that sensation where things that normally don't cause pain, like touch or, or movement, causes pain. Uh, if they have rapid escalation of their opioid requirements and they're not getting any relief, uh, they need to be evaluated for a syndrome called hyperalgesia. Uh, and that actually has helped with, uh, with tapering of opiates. The other people that, that need to not be on chronic controlled substances are those who can't follow the controlled substance agreements. So number nine. Is there a validated test which discriminates between patients at high risk or low risk of opiate medication misuse? Yes, no, yes, no, or I don't know. So our group thinks, uh, well, it looks like 47% don't know. Uh, and that's why we're here. Because there is the Dyer score. Uh, Belgrade Miles was a... Uh, He's, a, he's actually certified in neurology and psychiatry, but he was working at a pain and palliative care clinic in Minnesota. There was a physician who uh, prescribed lots of opiates in northern Minnesota, northern Minnesota, and uh, he ended up losing his license for the practices that he had. And so there are many family practitioners and many internists out in the, in the countryside of Minnesota who didn't know what to do with all the patients who came to them now uh, with saying that Dr. X had been prescribing my oxycodone, you know, what do I do now? Uh, and so he came up as, actually with a score, uh, which would help guide you if, if this patient is at risk or not at risk of misuse. Um, and the idea is you want to get more points in this score. Uh, the first thing you look at is the diagnosis. Is this, di the patient, does he have a diagnosis which should have chronic pain with it? Uh, is it severe ischemic disease, advanced neuropathy, severe spinal stenosis, you know, crush injuries? Those type things cause chronic pain, so you get three points there. But if you have a benign uh, condition like fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, nonspecific back pain, um, you only get one point for that. Intractability um, is really um, engagement. If the patient's fully engaged in all the treatments that you provide for pain, uh, then he'd get three points there. Uh, but if few therapies have been tried and the patient's passive as far as his treatment, he only gets one point. Now, as, as far as the risks go, there's a psychological risk. You know, patients who have good communication with clinic and uh, don't have a dis personality dysfunction or a mental illness, they get up to three points. But that patient that has uh, even severe dep depression, bipolar disease, uh, uh, severe... Uh, um, um, you know, schizophrenics with severe psychological dysfunction, they only get one point. Uh, 
chemical health, there's people who uh, are actively using illicit drugs. Only one point for that. Um, if you don't have any chemical dependency history and you're not drug focused, you get up to three points. And we have many patients who come in who are chemical copers. There's a pill for that, isn't there, Doc? Uh, the idea is to uh, rate as far as their chemical health. Reliability is something you can see by knowing their clinic, if they make it to clinic on time, if they are keeping appointments, missing appointments, if they've misplaced their prescriptions, they'd only get one point. But if they're very reliable, you'd get up to three points. Uh, and then social support. You know, you know if your patient, his life is in chaos, he only gets one point. But if he's got a supportive family and uh, has uh, work and school roles uh, and not socially isolated, he would get up to three points. And these are things that, that you kind of know from just visiting with your patient. Then there's the efficacy score. If your patient hasn't been on opiates before, you give them a two because uh, you know we don't know what the op opioids do. But they get only one point if they get poor function or they've got minimal pain relief despite moderate to high doses of, uh, of opiates. And they get... Uh, three points if there's good improvement in pain and function and uh, they're on stable doses. And so when we're working with the Dyer score, you're trying to get points. So if you can achieve more than 14 points on your Dyer score, you are a capable candidate. You're probably a good candidate for uh, long-term opiate analgesia if you've been through the other steps. You know, the Dyer score has a sensitivity of 94 percent and a specificity of 87% for predicting patient compliance. In other words, people that, that will not misuse their medications. So that's the Dyer score. And this is found in your uh, AIM Chronic Controlled Substance Guidelines. Question 10. Which of the following is included in the AIM Controlled Substance Agreement? Informed consent for use of controlled substances, the marijuana exception for use in neuropathic pain, uh, a legally binding covenant against cocaine use, a limitation of controlled substance prescriptions to only two providers. Let's see what our group thinks. So our group uh, overwhelmingly believes 71% uh, that informed consent for use of controlled substances is in there, and they would be correct. And this is what our, our um, and we don't want to call this a narcotics contract. <laughs> what we're calling it is a controlled substance agreement. Um, there is nothing legally binding about it. It's more of an informational thing. Uh, and it, it's so important, the preamble is so important, I'm going to go ahead and read that to you because this is something that your patients need to hear as you prescribe opiates. Uh, your AIM clinic doctor pledges to treat your pain, anxiety, and insomnia with controlled pain, anxiety pills to the best of their ability. The controlled pain and anxiety pills are medications like Lortab, Vicodin, and Valium. The abuse of pain and anxiety pills in Kentucky is a major problem. Your AIM doctors are required to be sure these pills aren't misused. To, pr to protect patients and the public, we will only prescribe controlled pain and anxiety pills if you agree with the terms listed below and follow all of them. Now this is written, we worked hard on this agreement, it's written at the fifth grade level. Uh, so that's why the, the, uh, it's, it's written the way that it is. So the codicils, the first is I'm responsible for my own controlled pain and anxiety pills. You know, you cannot tolerate patients mis misplacing their prescriptions or getting them stolen. Uh, and also, you know, it, it may not be clear to some of our patients that this, this isn't a commodity that you trade for something else. Uh, you don't have those hydrocodones to, you know, trade for uh, groceries or to trade for rent. Um, and they need to know they don't share, sell, or trade their, their pills. Number two, um, they'll not request or accept control substance pain and anxiety pills from other doctors. The idea is behind this agreement is that only one physician, only one group of physicians is going to prescribe these pills in order to have control over how they're given. Number three, I'll get refills of controlled pain and anxiety pills only during regular clinic hours, and that's how it can be regulated. That they, they can't be asking for, for these pills on the weekend. Um, we need to keep a, a record in the chart, in the electronic chart, of exactly how they're taking these medications. They should realize that pills are only part of my treatment. And so if they will not follow up with physical therapy or will not follow up with the with, uh, modalities we've asked them to do, that uh, they will have their controlled pain pills uh, actually stopped. Here, I agree I will not use any illegal drugs like marijuana or cocaine. 
Uh, marijuana is legal in many places, but we're going to ask them, uh, if you're going to take our opioid medicines, we're going to ask that you not take marijuana. And many of our patients then have a choice. They can use marijuana or they can use our chronic pain pills, but that's where AIM Clinic is right now. I guess if marijuana becomes legal, we may have to, to revisit that. I understand that controlled pain and anxiety pills can be dangerous, and here's some of the informed consent. They need to know, they need to know these things are dangerous, and they have to be uh, careful with them. And they understand if they break the rules, that they may have their medications tapered or stopped, and that you've discussed alternative treatments, that you worked up to this. Uh, and the other thing they need to, to denote a single pharmacy. We, we want only a single group of physicians and only a single pharmacy to prescribing your opiates when you have a controlled substance agreement. And so this is the relatively new one. There are some older ones floating around. If you see a different copy of this, this is the one that you want to use. Question 11. I know how to find and insert the AIM pain management form into my notes and all scripts. Yes, no, or maybe. The AIM pain management form. Okay, so it's a good thing I'm here. The uh, uh, looks like 79% are not sure how to find the AIM pain management form. And so this is what it looks like. Um, it uh, goes through briefly the five A's of uh, when you're managing someone who's taking chronic opioids, you want to know that they have, you want to address the five A's. The first, you want to know they have adequate analgesia or not. Describe how it's working for them. You want to know that they're having adequate activity, that their function is good. Uh, you want to, to make sure they're not having adverse drug reactions like uh, constipation or uh, that they're having uh, excess sleepiness. Uh, you want to know there's no aberrant behavior going on. The patient's not losing prescriptions. They're not taking the, their uh, medications when they shouldn't. Uh, they're not asking for early refills. And you want to check on their affect to make sure that they're not depressed. This other side is, is, is kind of for the legal things. And so, but if you want to add this form, you go to history of present illness and you right click and you get add a form below and you'll put in pain. And if you put in pain, you'll get this list. And what you want to look for is the AIM pain management form. And that'll give you this form, which will help inform your uh, documentation for these patients. And I guess in AIM, if you fill this form out, that is a history of present illness. You don't have to write anything else. Uh, you can go on to the review of systems and go on to the other things uh, as, you're, as, you're, as you're treating your patient and making your documentation. Well, question number 12. Why is the AIM pain management form inserted into a note? Is it to document compliance with the Federation of State Medical Boards model policy? Is it to document the risks of controlled substances? Is it to, a reminder for, of the, for the prescribers uh, of the legal requirements when prescribing opioids, or all of the above? Yeah, everybody nailed this. Is that, that's, that's 100%. I guess I gave away the answer. Yeah, and so sure enough, uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards has a document about how to document how to manage people with chronic opioids, and uh, that, that, they, that they should be monitored by assessing the five A's, which, which we discussed. Uh, and they are the adequate analgesia. And then these are little radio buttons that you push on the form. Adequate activity, adverse drug reactions, aberrant, aberrant behavior, and abnormal affect. And then it goes on to... to put in when the last laboratory urine drug screen was done, when the last CASPER report was performed, and it, when the last controlled substance agreement was discussed. So question 13, how often does Kentucky State Medical Board suggest that urine drug screens be performed for patients requiring chronic opiates? Should it be done every visit? Should it be done 25% of the time? Should it be done 50% of the visits? Or should it be done upon initiation of chronic controlled substance prescription. And so it looks like, uh, what, 42% believe uh, it should be done every visit. Uh, <coughs> next to 25% would say upon initiation. And so this is a tricky question. You know, the, uh, 
the law is that you have to obtain and document a baseline drug screen whenever you initiate chronic opioids. Um, we're talking about this patient that's, that's had pain more than three months, and you, and you plan to have them on chronic opioids. That's the law. Uh, the board, on the other hand, um, has developed intervals, and this is our medical licensure board because the law wasn't very clear. And they say that you should have a urine drug screen once a year if you're low risk, uh, twice a year if you're moderate risk to misuse, uh, three to four times a year if you're high risk, and at each office visit if you have aberrant behavior. So the answer is it depends. <coughs> Question 14. How often should the eCASPER database be consulted for patients requiring controlled substances? Should they be consulted every office visit? Uh, should it be uh, every narcotic prescription? Should the CASPER database be consulted every three months or just once a year? And this is actually codified in, in law as well. Yeah. And a significant amount, 58% believe every prescription. Uh, and the law, and actually this is what a CASPER looks like if you haven't seen one. Uh, you have the date that a prescription is filled. You've got the, the uh, prescription that was filled. You've got how many were given at the time and how many days is it expected to last. You kind of have an idea about how, how that was prescribed. Then you had the prescriber's name and, and city. And then the pharmacy. And what we're looking for in a, in a CASPER that we would call clean or without red flags, it'd be the same prescriber, be the same pharmacy, and there'd be regular intervals of, of these medications. But the law is that uh, we're to look at CASPER no less than every three months of our patients who are on chronic opiates. Okay, and back to question one. Uh, see if anyone, see if we're doing better now. Do you feel more competent, fairly competent, not very competent, or incompetent? And we're still fairly competent, good for us. Maybe a little more than fairly competent. Okay. Well, what questions do you have about the AIM con chronic controlled substance guidelines? Yeah. What's our final situation on Gallup? Oh. Um, gabapentin is a Schedule 5. It, it, we're not applying the guidelines for that. It's, it's not a narcotic. Uh, and so those, the, those, you know, we don't uh, prescribe, you know, Lyrica is also in that same group. It's a Schedule 5, and we're not doing that. Testosterone is also a Schedule 5, and all three of those are, are not going to be controlled substances for, uh, for the presence of AIM. Yeah. Okay, so everybody should get their AIM chronic controlled substance guidelines. Uh, and get them on your desktop at AIM, and that way you can refer to them. You can find the dire score, uh, and that's going to help you with these difficult things because prescribing opiates is difficult. So the second part is going to be the difficult discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about how to talk to our patients about opioid cessation and how to stop op opioids when it's necessary. And the first concept to get across is that an addicted patient has a stronger relationship with the drug than with you. So don't get upset with conflicts. Don't, don't take conflicts personally. So our objectives are first, to understand the perspective of the opioid habituated patient. Secondly, to identify features of a successful doctor-patient relationship, which you can use in any communication, and apply the principles of empathetic communication to a difficult discussion about opioid cessation. So we all know about the stages of grief. You know, that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, wrote about in Death and Dying. First there's denial, and then a patient goes through anger, then bargaining, then depression and acceptance. But there's a similar uh, stages of opioid cessation. Your patient may at first be hopeless and helpless. Uh, they'll be demanding and indignant. There'll be some bargaining that may go on. And then uh, finally we, they can go into the resignation phase and then acceptance of uh, the treatment plan that you have set out for them. Um, patients who are in denial or, or helpless and hopeless may say things like, this is the only treatment that's worked. I don't know what I'm going to do now. They may say, I've been on this medication for years. You can't change it. My girlfriend smokes pot, and I sat next to her one night. But someone broke into my house and stole my pills. And they may say, nobody else will help me. What would you do for my pain? And that's the helpless, hopeless patients. The 
angry, demanding patients will say, what kind of doctor are you? How do you expect me to live like this? I'm going to sue you if you stop my medications. If something happens to me, it's your fault. I'll have to get my pain medications on the street. Then the bargaining patient may say, well, what are you going to do if I go into withdrawal? Well, can I just have a month's supply so I can get a new provider? I will only be able to do physical therapy only if you give me my pain medication. And so those are the stages. Um, as you get into resignation and acceptance, that's, that's when you can have, you know, of course, better communication. But you have to deal with the first three stages first. The way you can do this is, is by two other concepts. First is mindfulness. Uh, the second is empathy. Uh, when we talk about mindfulness, uh, there's Adam Bray at the Chopra in Institute has a, a way to be mindful. And the idea is to center yourself. You've heard this called other things. And you're about to enter into a difficult discussion with the patient. There's going to be some conflict. And so first you want to clear your mind. So you want to stop. You want to stop what you're doing. You want to take some deep breaths. Uh, observe how you're feeling. If you're nervous going in there, if you're angry yourself going in there, um, if you're tired going in there, you want to observe how you feel. And then you want to proceed with kindness and compassion uh, as you have this doctor-patient relationship. The second concept is empathy. And this uh, Brene Brown, I'll have to listen... So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um. Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the difference between empathy and sympathy. And the empathy is what patients crave from us. Uh, but just having the heart-to-heart -heart, uh, is, is maybe not what's most important to the scientists in the group. There is some evidence that uh, physician empathy redu uh, reduces diabetic complications. Uh, in Parma, Italy, they took 242 primary care physicians and they gave them the Jefferson Scale of Empathy. In other words, it's kind of a little test you take to see how much empathy you have. Uh, and then they looked at uh, 20,000 of their diabetic patients in the year 2009. 
And what they found is those physicians who scored high in empathy, their patients had four complications per 1,000 diabetics. As opposed to those with moderate and low empathy, they had much higher complications per 1,000. And so there is some evidence that showing empathy for your patients uh, will reduce complications. And so how, how do we do this? Uh, one is with the queries, the questions that you ask, and they're open-ended. Uh, you know, would you or could you tell me more about that? You'll hear the palliative doctors say that all the time. Uh, tell me more. Uh, what has this been like for you? You know, these are queries. Is there anything else? Are you okay with that? Or just, you know, the body language and nodding and saying, hmm, uh, we'll get people to talk and open up. There's clarifications like, well, let me see if I have this right. Uh, I want to make sure I really understand what you're telling me. I'm hearing that so-and-so. I don't want us to go further until I'm sure I'm, I've understood. These clarifying statements let patients know that you're actually hearing them and also clarifies it. There's responses like, I can see that, that you are. I can imagine what that, that might feel like. Sounds like these are all uh, reflective listening Again, the patient will then understand that you have heard them if you use reflective listening. Uh, then there's things like, that's great, I bet you feel pretty good about that, or that sounds very difficult. Uh, anyone in your situation would feel that way. These are validating sentences. Uh, pe people love to be validated. So we'll move on to the interview. This is the interview that each of you is about to participate in. We're going to say there's, there's five parts of it. There's the opening we're, you're going to learn how to serve an empathy sandwich. Uh, you're going to work on negotiation, and you're going to be an empath empathetic broken record and then make a secure closing. In other words, stick the landing. So first of all, in the opening, before you enter, prepare. You know, it's pre-rounding. Uh, you, when you uh, go in and make, make the most of your first six seconds, you want to personalize your care by showing your knowledge of your patient, and together you want to set an agenda for, for your office visits. Uh, you want to know the patient's medical history. You want to know the patient's eCasper if they're using opiates. Uh, and you want to look for something personal that you can connect to the patient. So in the first six seconds, you want to make eye contact and say hello. Uh, you don't want to take the computer in there and just start typing away in the computer uh, or looking down at your papers. You want to greet the patient by name. Patients uh, respond to their names. You want to introduce yourself and your role. Uh, you know, just the act of coming to clinic, you've hit lots of, of me medical professionals already. Uh, they need to know what your role is. And then body language is important. Sit down. Uh, it's known that if you sit down during a clinic visit, patients think you spent twice the amount of time that you actually did. Um, and you want to lean in. Your body language is important. In fact, I know an attending who carries a stool around with him on rounds so he can sit. You want to personalize your care by showing knowledge of the patient, some personal knowledge and also the medical knowledge. Uh, you want to know what the patient's prescriptions are. You want to know what the patient said before. And together you want to decide on an agenda. For this difficult, dis difficult discussion, you want to state your positive intent. You don't want to be punitive. You want to firmly state that we have a difficult discussion. You want to use partnership language like we, us, and together. Uh, these are things that will gender partnership. And then you want to provide an empathy sandwich. Heart-to-heart uh, -heart discussions are the ones that you're going to get the, the most from. F friends and family, you know, you're having a heart-to-heart -heart discussion, and those are nice. Head-to-head uh, -head is what I like to do in medicine. I like to say, well, this is the evidence, and this is what we're going to do. You know, what do you think about that? What's your evidence? Very seldom when you have a head-to-head -head, uh, discussion with, with a patient. Your educations are too disparate to allow that. But what you're looking for is to serve an empathy sandwich. Uh, in other words, a, uh, you want to voice empathy, discuss the facts, and then close with empathy. For instance, if your patient says, I'm having terrible pain, you, would you can respond, well, I'm so sorry, I see that you're in terrible pain. You know, I have empathy. Uh, then you can say, we can't use oxycodone to treat this pain because it's a dangerous narcotic. That's the, the truth, the hard fact. And the heart again says, I do want to help you. And I know that you can be strong enough to manage this pain. Let's look at some examples. Explain this to artists and how are you? 
And I've been the same doc in pain, and then a little tick to your nurse so wouldn't refill my pain pills. Well, that's because it's our clinic policy that patients need to be seen in order to refill my products. Okay, well, I'm seen, so I can take care of business. Well, I'm a little uncomfortable refilling the pain medication. It's eight weeks into your injury. You've completed physical therapy. The CT scan didn't really show anything structural in the matter. I would expect that by now you'd be able to return to at least modified work. I can't believe you, doctors. If you were sitting in my place, you'd be writing that prescription in a second. Actually, I have been in your place. In fact, I had to have surgery. And I can tell you that two days after the surgery, I was off the pain medication. Yeah, well, if you weren't a quack, maybe you would have had a real doctor fix my fat by now. Okay. <laughs> That's a little harsh. Yeah. But in the second video, let's see if we can't uh, find an empathy sandwich. Em empathy sandwich. So that we feel like pain pills. You do look a little uncomfortable. Okay. Well, you can take care of it for me. Actually, I'm not so sure about the pain medication. You actually are eight weeks into this illness. You have had the physical therapy all that time. The CT scan was normal. I do realize that you're still in pain. But I'd like to see you getting back to some work. Maybe modified work. Well, I'm not bad. I don't believe you, Dr. Skip. If you were sitting in my place, you'd be writing that prescription in a second. I do realize that if the pain medication helps and you're still in pain, then you want more of it. Okay, so? Well, why don't we see if we can get you feeling better, but also functioning better, so you can get back to work? I want to get back to work. I need to have some money coming in. But I can't do my job properly without the pain pills. Look, I realize you can't do your regular job, but maybe we can ask your physical therapist for some ideas about how you can do some modified work so you don't jeopardize the progress that you've been making. I can give you some pain pills so in case you're sore at the end of the day, but let's try something a little less strong while you're on the job. I guess we'll let you that try. There's two different outcomes, and did, did you notice the empathy sandwich, how he would put the truth in between empathetic statements? Negotiation uh, is the middle part of the interview you're about to embark on. Uh, you want to find common ground. You can find almost always find some common ground uh, with your patient. Um, you want to identify the options, and you want to roll res resistance. You know, there's some boundaries that you're going to set, and you just have to know where you keep, keep where your boundaries are uh, and look at the different options. For instance. Uh, if the patient says, this is the only treatment that has worked, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Uh, you could say things like, at every visit, we reevaluate whether the benefits of the medication outweigh the risks. And at this point, the medications are no longer safe for you. Say, so if your patient says, I've been on this medication for years, you can't change it. Well, we both agree, we have some common ground here, that you have violated your controlled substance agreement. Put yourself in my shoes. You know, what options do you think I have? Uh, the passive uh, person may say, uh, my girlfriend smokes pot and I sat next to her one night. But your response might be, I understand that pot's everywhere. Your urine drug screen test is a two-part test. The second part is confirmation that you had enough pot in your system to feel its effects. But someone broke into my house and stole my pills. Well, we do not fill prescriptions early for lost or stolen pills unless you have a police report for the theft. Nobody else will help me. What will you do for my pain? Well, I'll continue to work with you to manage your pain, but only with non-opioid medications. And so for the angry, demanding patient, you know, what kind of doctor are you? How do you expect me to live like this? I understand how frustrating and scary this is, empathy. But selling your medications or obtaining a dish, having a dirty urine is one of the reasons I cannot prescribe the, the medications. You know, we agreed we reviewed this in our agreement before starting this medication. Okay. And then the patient may say, I'm going to sue you if you stop my medication. Well, under federal law, it's illegal for me to prescribe opioid pain medication to prevent withdrawal or addiction. And if something happens to me, whoops, it'll be your fault. I'll have to get my pain medications on the street. I understand that you've been taking these medications for a long time, and certainly your body is dependent on them. I would like to help you become independent from the drugs. 
So in your patient who's bargaining, what are you going to do if I get if I have withdrawal? Well, I don't want you to suffer withdrawal. I can prescribe you other medications like clonidine or loperamide to help you with the side effects of withdrawal, or you can slowly decrease your m- remaining medications. In bargaining, the patient may ask, can I have a month's supply so I can find a new provider? You know, because of you were found selling your drugs or you have a dirty urine, I can't prescribe you more opioid pain medications. That's a boundary that you'll set. I will only be able to do physical therapy if I have medication for the pain. I'm feeling pushed to prescribe you a medication I've already told you is not medically appropriate. And so those are kind of the negotiating stances that you want to take. The next is, is you want to be an empathetic broken record. In other words, over and over again, you want to be listening and understanding what they're saying, and you per- want to persist in expressing caring over and over again. Now you want to be clear about the bottom line. You want to persist in expressing caring through your conversation, and you want to convey your bottom line message over and over again, just like this slide, over and over again, uh, until the patient realizes that you're not going to change your mind. And in closing, uh, you want to check the patient's understanding and comfort with the next steps. You want to ensure that the office visit is closed, and you want to make the last six seconds a positive memory for the patient. You, know, you want to check understanding, teach back, excellent time to use teach back. Um, I want to be sure I explain this well. Tell me what do you understand as the next steps. Whenever you do teach back, you want to be sure that you're not treating the patient as if they're stupid. You, know, uh, you want to make it clear to them that if I may not explain this well. Can you explain to me back uh, what, what, our, what our plan going forward is to, to treat your pain? And you want to ensure closure. Don't open up new topics of conversation. Um, I'm, I'm fond of saying, what questions do you have? That's a big open question. But in this instance, you're going to say, what questions do you have about what we have decided on today or what we've talked about today? And that ensures closure here as you get to the end of an, of an, of an office visit that, that has to be you know, a finite amount of time. And then make the last six seconds a positive memory. Be appreciative for the patient's role. Um, thank you for understanding and working on this. And be supportive and offer good wishes and a, and a warm goodbye. Uh, patients will respond to this. But remember that an addicted patient has a stronger relationship with the drug than with you, so don't take conflicts personally. <coughs> so at this point, we're going to form groups of three. Everybody needs to get in a group of three, and you're going to choose a role, either one, two, or three, and uh, we'll turn in a difficult discussion observation tool for every participant.